This is the red Komodo, and I've got the A7S III, which is what we're using now. So naturally, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison real quick and see if you can tell the difference while I talk about the camera. Now, I got both because I couldn't decide between them. I figured the A7S III would be more convenient, but the Komodo would be, you know, it would have better image quality. That's true in some respect, but being that I only want to film in 4K, this test will show you that it's pretty difficult to tell the 4K images apart. The Komodo has, uh, the noise looks really organic, and the A7S III is completely noiseless, like straight up surgical. For one of these comparisons, I added noise to the Sony, and for the other one, I performed noise reduction on the RED. So I'll be comparing the noise added image of the Sony to the natural image of the RED, and the noise reduced image of the Komodo to the natural image of the Sony A7S III. Also, I did push my skin tones pretty significantly. It gave myself a bit of a tan. Uh, I've been inside a lot lately, so I don't remember what that looks like. Both images performed identically when pushing my skin tones though. Someone on Twitter did say that it looked like I had a sunburn and I think that was kind of my goal. And if you think that the colors don't match perfectly well, it's mainly because I'm kind of a noob and I just eyeballed it. I'm not a color correctionist uh, or a colorist or whatever, but I'm pretty confident that the colors can be matched easily enough by a professional. Now for the reveal, the Komodo is camera A, and the Sony a7S III is camera B. Some people got it right, some people got it wrong, but in reality it's just very difficult to tell the images apart unless you had a side-by-side -side like I did here of both cameras filming the same thing at the same time, and you can see both images at the same time next to each other. After the images graded and rendered, the rest of the information that you captured with those files is completely irrelevant, and I'm not pushing the colors too hard. I'm generally pretty on target when it comes to proper exposure in my controlled environment. A much more important thing to improve image quality is understanding light and how it works, and then owning a set of good lights. And if you film outdoors a lot, that means probably also a good set of NDs and a matte box. But this video isn't really about lighting entirely, it's about a camera. Here's where it gets interesting. My E7S III was using just 10-bit 422 recorded internally, the XAVCS codec at 100 megabits per second. On my last video, uh, the 14 minute A-roll clip that I recorded was 12 gigabytes and the Red Komodo A-roll of 6K at maximum compression was 100 gigabytes. The file size is roughly 10 times the size of what I'm used to with the A7S III in my preferred settings. For testing purposes, I also recorded 40 frames per second at 6K in HQ, which is the minimum compression. Uh, and that two minute file was 35 gigabytes. Just recording at 4K at LQ on the red, which is the maximum amount of compression for this camera, uh, for a 4K file, will still net you a file size four times larger than what I'm used to with the Sony a7S III. And I'm running a 2017 iMac Pro, and it runs multiple streams of both graded RED 6K at maximum compression and graded Sony 4K files just fine. Actually, during all my testing, I also recorded all my media on the Silicon Pro 512 CFast card, which costs exactly half the price of the Angelbird CFast cards. And the card performed really just fine. You will still get a warning when using that card instead of using something that's RED approved, like the Angelbird CFast cards. I think that's only because Silicon Power hasn't paid the licensing fee or the testing fee that needs to be paid to RED before they approve it and stop showing that warning on media. I think that's how it works. I could be wrong. I don't work at RED and I haven't talked to anybody, but through my speculation and through things that I've heard other people say, I think that's possibly the case. In my own experience, this 512 gigabyte CFAS card works just fine recording the highest possible data rate that the RED will produce. I had a similar issue with the Sony a7S III when I was using batteries from unapproved vendors. They, which is basically any battery that's not a Sony genuine battery that has a little hologram on the back. You still have to put up with an annoying warning that says this battery can damage your camera, which in reality is just a battery that Sony didn't make. But that's a whole different topic and we're not gonna go into that right now. I think RED has a better reason for showing this issue 
with the media, their cameras need to record media and not drop any data because they only have one CFast card slot. They need to make sure they have a list of media that they've personally confirmed will work with their own internal testing because there's only one card slot, there's no backup, and they need to make sure that whatever they recommend works. Anyways, the 4K overall image quality is roughly the same, in my personal opinion. My opinion is subjective and untrained compared to certain seasoned pros. That being said, it's certainly different straight out of the camera. And the baked in noise profile of the Komodo's image does seem to prompt a little bit less banding after pushing colors around because the noise breaks it up, I guess. And it looks a little bit better than the, the fake noise that I added to the Sony a7S III image, but I only use the built-in noise tools of DaVinci Resolve to add that noise to the Sony footage. So there's probably better plugins that will do that more accurately. But trying to match the surgical noiseless image that the Sony produces would take some heavy processing on the noise reduction tools of the red footage, another step in a workflow. So I guess it maybe really depends on what look you're trying to achieve. Is it a completely sterile noise-free image or is it an organic film looking image like from a cinema camera? What all this tells me is that I personally still have a lot to learn about the red Komodo and how R3D files work. I could be a little baby and say that I'm selling my Komodo for another Sony or something like that. And I might end up just doing that, but I'm still a novice personally at color grading and an amateur filmmaker with red cameras in particular. This is my first cinema camera ever. There are also other things to consider beyond color, noise, and file sizes of the 4K output though. Sony has low light performance beyond what was possible up until very recently. Shooting with lenses like the Lawa 24 millimeter probe at f14 doesn't require any special lighting because you can use ISO 12800 and basically you can't do that with the red because you need to blast your lighting because the red has horrible ISO performance beyond about 1600. Red, however, can record 6K and the 6K image is far superior to Sony's 4K image. It's sharper and overall better looking with more room to move it around in post. You can still crop in after the fact and achieve that beautiful 4K that we just compared of the Sony if you need to, meaning you have more room to frame and punch in for those shots that you only have one chance to capture. And perhaps surprisingly, the autofocus on the Red Komodo holds up extremely well. I was using just the adapted Sigma 18 to 35 in these tests, the same one that I used on my GH5 for several years. And in fact, the glass on here is the same glass. It's the Sigma 18 to 35, but in a converted housing by PC Hood Cinematics. The glass on this Sigma 1835 was dissected, rehoused, and declicked into a parfocal lens. And I'll be doing a full comparison of these this lens versus the original Sigma 1835 soon. But I did manage to get a coupon code for anyone wanting to save 5%. Tommy is the coupon. The real reason I would recommend anyone should buy the Komodo at this point would be if you need the best possible image quality available captured with a global shutter. Movies are called movies because they are moving pictures, or movies for short, as opposed to stills. Movies capture light and motion, and capturing those things with a global shutter more closely resembles reality. But rolling shutter has gotten so good in modern cameras, it's difficult to make a case for global shutter anymore at all. Aries cameras don't have global shutter. I was going to rig up uh, a spinning thing to demonstrate rolling shutter, and I may do that in the future, but the easiest demonstration is just showing a flickering light effect using the Rotolite Titan. Gunshots, camera flashes, explosions, flash bulbs are all instant sources of light that create a disgusting looking banding effect when captured with a rolling shutter because of how rolling shutter works. And in some cases, you only get a chance to capture something like that once. And this is where global shutter is probably the most useful to me. Cars flying by windows and propeller blades on aircraft might be another place where this becomes pretty important. But I even caught a helicopter dropping water onto a fire ironically caused by a local movie production. Look at the helicopter blades. This was captured on the Sony a7S III. It wasn't immediately next to me or filling the frame, but those blades still look pretty darn straight. And I'm sure the effect will be exaggerated if I were to have something like this take up the whole frame, but nonetheless, rolling shutter is approaching a level where the motion distortion is nearly negligible unless something is going the speed of light. That's making me feel like the global shutter is almost a specialty tool for VFX artists. It's nice to have, and your motion will look technically more natural if you're whipping the camera around, 
and I would definitely say it should be used for action sequences or anything where the movie has a fast moving character or a train or an object that you need warping to be prevented in or obviously flashing lights. But that's it. My reason for buying the Komodo were one, to improve the image quality of my videos, YouTube compression be damned. Two, was to have a more professional, better workflow. Well, that didn't happen. The Komodo takes like 25 seconds to turn on. If the ambient temperature changes more than 20 degrees, I need to re-black shade the camera. Or if the shutter speed changes by more than a fraction of a second, I need to re-black shade the camera again. And that takes a couple of minutes. And then the added cost of managing these massive files totally sucks. The little baby screen on the back of the Komodo is complete garbage, so I had to pick up the seven inch monitor to make sense of it. And I finally got the small HD Indy 7, the, a seven inch monitor that has red control. So with this monitor, I can finally actually control the camera. I can start recording, stop recording, change all my compression settings and frame rates. So that monitor is really handy to actually make sense of how I'm supposed to use this camera. Uh, it did take like another 45 days to show up after I ordered it. And the red Komodo, that one took 91 days to ship. So if you want to get a rig built out, you need to either pay a lot of money for one, someone who's willing to sell, or you need to be extremely patient and wait several months to build your kit. And I went with a monitor because the app control on the iPad is complete garbage. It disconnects frequently, it, the image is very stuttery, it's, it's less reliable than what I was led to believe. So for me, I'm still a little bit on the fence about the Komodo. If I was going to recommend a camera to someone with the end goal of 4K, I would still recommend the Sony a7S III with the rest of the budget being spent on lights. It's a lot easier to use, has a faster workflow, dual card slots, better and easier to use autofocus that you don't have to enable every time you turn the camera on. It has plenty of latitude in the files and unless you need to record special effects or a ton of fast motion, it seems like the Komodo has a very, very steep and expensive learning curve. It's not that the Komodo is a bad camera, it's actually an incredible piece of tech for what they've developed with the global shutter. It's also a much more specialized tool. The a7S III ticks all of my personal boxes with of 4K with a much lower cost of entry in terms of both knowledge and price. And using either camera for YouTube can produce nearly identical looking images. Denoising red will take a lot of processing time and adding film noise to the a7S III will take processing time. So for that, it's really about what kind of image you want to deliver. There are intangibles though starting with the platform of delivery. YouTube will likely degrade any difference in noise pattern and screw up subtle differences in colors. And then anyone who's invested in a red cinema camera probably has an in-depth understanding of how to use light, which almost certainly is the primary reason why any creator working with professional cinema cameras has better looking videos on YouTube regardless of what camera they're talking about. It seems like the red is an insurance policy on your footage. You may have a bit more range to push color, maybe, and it'll never overheat, you can record forever, and you can capture global shutter motion and light. All the things that you might need if you're spending a million dollars on a scene and you need that shot to be perfect, which makes sense. And well, there's also the fact that it shoots in 6K and if you can put up with a 6K data workflow, using the 6K image from the Komodo pushed into a 4K timeline looks even better because obviously it's downsampled to 4K from 6K. It's sharper and the noise is even more beautiful in my opinion. It's like the best of both worlds in terms of image quality, but no one on YouTube viewing this will ever really be able to experience what I'm talking about there because of the way the compression deteriorates the image. So what I really want personally, I think, is a Sony a7S III with a built-in V-mount battery slot, or maybe the FX6 with the V-mount battery module if they ever make the autofocus work identically to, way, to the way the a7S III's autofocus works. All that being said, I know I still have a lot to learn about the Komodo and where it fits exactly into my own personal workflow. I had a similar learning curve with the A7S III, so be subscribed. I have more videos about this coming soon and some of the accessories that I use to build out this kit. Thanks for watching. Peace.